Thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm Simon, I'm an epidemiologist, um, and I've had an extremely warm and hospitable time and time. Um, thanks very much, Dr. Tower. I won't try and pronounce your last name. It's too challenging. I won't get out of any shit that time. Thanks, Gerhard, for all the work that you've done behind the scenes and certainly has been working hard. And uh, Dr. Provoca as well has uh, been making things happen. So thank you very much. And this is very much an answer to prayer <laughs> for me. Um, and a warm uh, welcome from the uh, choir was just, uh, as the minister said, heavenly this morning. Um, so I'm an epidemiologist, a numbers person. I'll just start by telling a little story about uh, statisticians and epidemiologists. There was a statistician, a normal person, and they were both sentenced to death. And they were given one last wish. And the statistician said, hmm, I want to give a talk about everything I know in statistics. And then the, the jailer was saying to the normal person, well, what's your last wish? And he said, well, I want to die first. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I suppose uh, a lot of us have a fear of statistics. <laughs> uh, that sort of stuff. Um, I didn't get into this uh, topic uh, for the, the love of numbers, but really what we can do about it uh, Scabies has been just an incredible learning experience for me and uh, what we can, the uh, experience from Lucha that we can do a lot about this and uh, the experience in other Pacific countries is that that can happen. I'm going to focus more on the relationship between Scabies and rheumatic fever Okay, so we'll share some of the journey that we've been on. Okay, so the talk will cover some of the reasons why I was suspicious of the traditional views around rheumatic fever causation, a few missteps that we made, or importantly we've been learning from our mistakes, uh, why scabies is a plausible alternative, the difficulties and confusion over poor scabies diagnosis that I think Cello was alluding to, uh, how scabies infestation can be quite subtle sometimes, and look at some of what I consider to be the strongest epidemiological evidence I've seen in my career that scabies is linked with rheumatic fever. So for people who are new to rheumatic fever, um, scabies, some of the things that are sort of given with rheumatic fever, scabies is almost exclusively a disease of Maori and Pacific children in New Zealand. It's linked obviously to strep throat, we're not questioning that. Runs in families and is associated with poverty. Many cases have evidence of skin sepsis and the diagnosis is based on a variety of clinical features which include recent strep infection. So I thought we had all the answers back in med school, and this is a famous meta illustration, which kind of means it's part of medical folklore that it's all about uh, strep throat. And this is what we've been seeing in New Zealand. Um, and this was the road to success. Unfortunately, tracking the numbers, it hasn't been. Um, and we see, as you can see, very high rates in uh, Maori and Pacific people, almost no uh, rheumatic fever in other ethnic groups. And this is the real puzzle for me trying to work out what was going on. And one could think, is this the case for every disease in New Zealand? Well, here's uh, public health data on salmonella, and no, it's not. Uh, many other uh, ethnic groups get many other diseases, but rheumatic fever is an exception. So, oh, Mila is uh, Middle Eastern, Latin American, and African. 
So that's kind of a sort of a cluster of sort of smaller ethnic groups in, in New Zealand. Okay, so um, we've had a good go in New Zealand uh, at treating early strep throats with antibiotics through school programs. Uh, spent seventy million dollars on it, um, uh, and unfortunately, it doesn't. You can hardly see the the blue here was the era of the school program, but not a convincing difference. You can see the top is the Pacific, the middle, the blue is Maori, and the yellow is European. So you can see the ethnic differences are, are maintained. So this is one of the interesting aspects to me, is what are some of the things which are not explained by the traditional bacteria-centric theory of uh, rheumatic fever? And there's been some very interesting studies done in New Zealand. Uh, and one of the features that we see is that when we look at who tests positive for a strep throat, there's no difference by ethnicity, which is completely different to what you see with human fever. When you look at the skin, yes, you do see a difference, but it's only a twofold difference. But it's certainly a much more convincing looking at the skin than the throat. Uh, do we see an increased risk of rheumatic fever after a positive test, either from the throat or the skin? Yes, we do. Uh, the incidence increases uh, sharply uh, in both cases. But there's digging deeper into this uh, paper which looked at uh, skin swabs, we see that there's, even if we look at kids that test positive for a uh, strep in the throat, you see there's still a huge difference by ethnicity in terms of risk of rheumatic fever. And you would ask yourself, why is there that difference? What could be the second factor? And then when you look at uh, positive strep throat in the, on the skin, so not in the throat, the last one is the throat. Not a single case from over 13,000 positive uh, skin swabs for group A strep in the European children, whereas in Maui and Pacific, are much higher rates. So what could be this second factor which is important that might explain these uh, issues? So yeah, I think you probably guess what the second factor is by now. Uh, so this is the traditional view that we have in New Zealand. Um, and I like to think that my first thought was scabies, but it wasn't. It was, it was about teeth. We, uh, Gerhard and I were looking at sugar at the time, and I thought that perhaps teeth could be it. Uh, certainly Pacific kids, do have high rates of uh, rotten teeth uh, in um, New Zealand and particularly those living in more deprived areas. So I thought this could be the answer. Uh, this is the diagram that we, uh, we thought that sugar was acting as a fuel promoting strep um, bacteria. And we even got this published, and this is probably one of my better uh, cited studies, um, and there's some statistical evidence to support uh, this idea, but quite a subtle increase in risk. Um, so kids with more rotten teeth had more rheumatic fever than kids with fewer rotten teeth, but it was a rather subtle difference, and it didn't explain the ethnic differences that we saw. Uh, so it was like trying to uh, put a, a square peg in a round hole. So just to summarise some of the chinks in the, the group A strep throat to rheumatic fever theory, uh, there were more problems with traditional theory. In many cases, rheumatic fever didn't get a sore throat. 
There's little association between rates of group, uh, group A street and rheumatic fever, and the school program unfortunately wasn't a rip-roaring success. And so, as you might have guessed, uh, Australia came to the um, came to the rescue, and people like Lucia have been uh, working in scabies for many years, and the view in Australia couldn't be more different than what it is in New Zealand. In fact, we have the traditional view here, which is the second two boxes, but there's this third box at the start, which mentions scabies, and that's, that was the missing link. And in Australia, going to rheumatic fever or skin uh, conferences, um, most of the time was spent talking about scabies. Um, so let's just have a little look at some of the evidence. Uh, Luch has talked about the biology, but uh, I think there's some really interesting stuff. When I started looking at it, I thought it was just about mites punching holes in the skin, but it's a lot more than that. Uh, it is uh, the mites actually secrete various proteins which uh, get in the way and block innate immunity. Uh, there's some interesting stuff to know that a uh, common misconception is that human scabies also infects animals and their species are in fact quite different and are specific to the particular mammal. So pigs and dogs do get a form of scabies but it's, it, it's called mange uh, and the, the species of scabies is, is quite different. So, Pigs and dog mange can infect humans, and human scabies can go the other way. So another thing worth considering is there are two theories, but is the, different, is the difference trivial or is it important? And I'm saying that I think it is important because one leads to improved diagnosis and treatment of scabies, whereas the other focuses on antibiotics and the strip vaccine, which has been a long time uh, in development, but is, has not been with us so far. So what about the skin? Uh, Luch has covered this. Um, we see that when we look at uh, the epidemiology of scabies, we see that the same countries tend to feature with rheumatic fever, and the Pacific tends to have a high prevalence of both. In the Aboriginal community, for example, in Australia, it's by mom, there's a high prevalence of scabies and also a high prevalence of rheumatic fever. And we thought, well, let's put those two figures together and see if there's a relationship. This is one of the things that states people get excited about, is seeing a strong linear relationship and actually, if you look at the details here, there's a lot of log relationship. It's interesting that in these countries, they do both an eco-survey and a scabies survey. And uh, the higher the prevalence of scabies, the higher the prevalence of rheumatic fever. And it's almost a one-to-one -one difference. Some very interesting uh, historic studies um, for example, in Trinidad, there was an outbreak of scabies, and it's just casually mentioned in the study that there was a following outbreak of rheumatic fever. Um, so our first cohort study uh, looked at dental products, uh, and you can imagine why, because we were obsessed about teeth. Um, but we looked at evidence that kids had been in hospital with scabies before and after their visit and looked at the outcome with uh, rheumatic fever. And this plot may not um, be of interest to people who are not stats people, but for me it made me fall off my chair because the kids without, the kids without Evidence of scabies had a very low risk of rheumatic fever, with a little grey line down there. And this is the kids that had uh, scabies in the hospital after uh, their dental visit. And the difference was a 28-fold difference. 
when you adjusted for confounders, potential confounders, the difference was an eightfold difference. But still, this is huge compared to the differences that you normally see in epidemiology. And cardiovascular disease is up to the 10 or 5 percent difference. Makes you excited here, it's a 900 percent difference. And so uh, I didn't get a huge response from that, so I thought, well, people get convinced by maps these days. And uh, so I looked at where permethrin was being uh, dispensed in Auckland, and you can see the dark areas are where the permethrin is being dispensed. The, uh, the South Auckland is, is where most of the action has happened and the open circles are where rheumatic fever is happening. And this is the strongest relationship I've ever seen. See a very strong relationship also between Pacific ethnicity and neighbourhoods of permethrin uh, prescribing. And there's lots of other factors that you need to account for. We did in a regression model. Uh, and this is the summary. Basically, if you've got low rates of permethrin prescribing uh, in your neighbourhood, you've got low rates of rheumatic fever, high rates of permethrin prescribing, very high rates of rheumatic fever. Again, one of the strongest statistical associations I've ever seen. And I challenge you to find a stronger one. Um, this is what happens if you ask a computer to tell us what you think the causal relationships are between the variables in our study. And so you see a relationship between permethrin and rheumatic fever. Strong association between uh, ethnicity, deprivation, permethrin, and Pacific, the direct association with rheumatic fever. So lots of statistical evidence to support the idea. So this led me to think, well, how common is scabies in New Zealand? We really don't know. They haven't been a study in 30 years, 40 years, I think. And uh, I actually had a look at Lucy's data and saw that she had made a casual remark that there was a uh, the relationship between impetigo and scabies was very strong with a relative risk of 56, I think. And this is what a uh, relative risk of 56 looks like. Basically, if you've got impetigo, you've got scabies. So, uh, and all the, uh, the clinical documents in New Zealand are talking the same that uh, in Tigo is a bacterial disease, not a lot to do with scabies, which uh, surprised me. So I think we were under assessing scabies, that gave me a clue. Uh, this was the last study before ours to look at scabies in New Zealand, so lower rates in European, higher in Maori and higher in Pacific. This was our first our first study, we went to a childcare centre in Otago with a high prevalence of skin sores and asked clinicians to diagnose scabies. And I gave them absolutely no direction, just do what you think is best. Uh, there was little, almost no agreement. Uh, and the dermatologist was, in fact, I felt the worst in terms of underdiagnosing because they focused on only the specific features which were burrows and mites, not the papules. Uh, so for people who haven't seen papules, these are hopefully fairly familiar, um, small raised inflammatory dots, often um, itchy. Uh, so Dan in Australia, Dan Engelman, a pediatrician, uh, helped us with the uh, diagnosis. So focusing on papules rather than burrows and mites is very important in my view in terms of accurately assessing the burden of scabies in the community. And so this is a few 
Uh, so our dermatologist did see a few burrows, but these are very subtle and we completely missed them. So I know I'm keeping you from lunch, so we'll, uh, we'll try and uh, hurry things along. This is a scaled rectangle diagram that shows the data that we've collected uh, in New Zealand, about 180 kids. Uh, the the grey uh, rectangle represents those with uh, typical or atypical lesions, that's the papules. Uh, the green is the ones that are formally diagnosed using the um, latest clinical criteria, so they also have features, itch features, history features. Uh, interestingly enough, we noticed that a lot of the kids and their families were being treated with topical steroids, calamine lotion, uh, also other anti-itch stuff, so anti topical antihistamines, making the diagnosis uh, more difficult. And we've also uh, got a chiller per se from Queensland because there was often a lot of contested diagnoses with GPs giving other diagnoses. We thought let's get some objective data on this. So we, uh, Cello is going to talk to you tomorrow about the PCR test, but it was very useful in contested cases to have uh, PCR positive. And you see that the, uh, uh, the yellow is the PCR positive. And um, there's going to be more on this in the afternoon, but a recent study in Tonga showed a very strong association between echo findings of rheumatic fever uh, and so thickened heart valves and uh, papules um, indicative of scabies with a relative risk of 2.5 uh, p value just above the significance level, but I think that's a type 2 error. This is a very strong association. Population attributable risk suggests that if you get rid of scabies, at least 40% of rheumatic fevers uh, would be removed. And it's likely to be higher than that. Why? Because the clinical assessment of scabies, as I think Lucia mentioned, is, uh, is, is, is really the tip of the iceberg. The trial results show that if you treat everyone, you do a lot better in terms of reducing the burden of the disease. So, uh, as epidemiologists, we often lean on what we call the Bradford Hill criteria, which is really just scientific common sense. Is there a strong association? I hope I've convinced you that there is. Uh, is there a dose-response relationship? Uh, is there a temporality? Yes, if you dig into these studies, there are. The only thing that we're really missing is experimental evidence. I think another issue that I just want to touch on, which I think is related to the issue of NDA, is where's the threshold, where should be the threshold for treatment? And epidemiologists often uh, think about this. A common method of considering the treatment of populations is the net benefit. So you, you're treating two populations, those who have the disease, and they're going to benefit from ivermectin or permethrin. And if you do MDA, for example, you're going to treat some who don't have the disease. And all they're going to get are the side effects. So the threshold should be uh, based on uh, that uh, benefit and risk. Now, if you think about uh, scabies, uh, ivermectin has very few side effects, so the threshold should be very low, uh, suggested in the act. So I think thinking of it from that point of view certainly does point us in the NDA direction. So, just in summary, I want to say that uh, Scabies offers a fresh new approach to pneumatic fever prevention. The evidence that will make a dramatic difference to the burden of rheumatic fever is growing by the day, and the data is fresh off the press from right here in time. Um, thank you very much for um, giving me the time um, to present. Thank you.